morning and welcome or good afternoon, uh, really whatever time it is that you're joining the nonprofit show. We're so glad that you are here. Today we have Aquanetta Betch joining us and she is Director of Planned Giving. And I'm so excited to have you with us, Aquanetta, to talk to us about planned giving trends that our nonprofit community and our leaders need to know. So stay with us as we dive deep into this vast conversation. It's one, Julia, I am not very versed in, and so I'm looking forward to learning. Um, good morning to you, Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. So grateful to serve alongside you as the co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group. Honored day in and day out to have the ongoing support from our amazing presenting sponsors, not only are they here for the episodes, they're really here for you, our viewers, our listeners across the globe. So a shout out to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, as well as Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. So please do check out these companies. We invite you to lean into them and their missions. I like to say that their mission is really your mission because they want to help you do more good in, around, and throughout your community. So thank you to our amazing sponsors. They have helped us to produce nearly 900 episodes as I lift my jaw off the floor day in and day out. I still get that amazing, I see you, Aquanetta, you're shaking your head. Like, how do you do this every day? I get that response from so many people. Uh, and you can listen to all of our previous recording episodes, including this one in just a couple of hours. So you can scan that QR code now and download the app. You'll get a notification that today's live conversation has been uploaded. It literally takes just a couple of hours. Um, we are on it uh, very quick. You can also still find us on streaming broadcast and podcast platforms. So wherever you like to consume your entertainment, wherever you want to nerd out in your car, if you're walking, traveling, working out, uh, whatever that might look like. So go ahead and tune in and and also let us know which shows you're really liking because we have a lot of them and we're not going anywhere. So we're going to keep this up. <laughs> So back to our guest, Aquanetta Betts. So excited to have you here with us today. Again, for those of you watching and listening, Aquanetta is the Director of Planned Giving at George Mason University. Thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome to you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate being here and uh, looking forward to sharing some trends in Planned Giving. What's happening out there today? Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I would love if we can do a, like an umbrella question. What is planned giving? Because yes, that's talk. something that I feel we might talk about in our careers and our world, but we don't really dive deep. So can you just give us an example of what planned giving is or a definition? Sure, a, a definition. Uh, I recall someone uh, saying that Robert Sharp, uh, he is now uh, deceased, but he was uh, the guru, really a, a founder in the plan giving space. His simple definition was if it's a plan gift, it usually takes three parties to be involved to make the gift happen. Okay. There's the donor, the organization, and then another entity, whether it is perhaps uh, an advisor, an attorney, uh, maybe there's a real estate transaction that needs to happen. So it's more than just the donor and the organization that needs to get involved. Very simplistic, but I think that's it in a nutshell. Um, plan giving also is the type of program that an organization certainly can see sustainability through those sorts of gifts, which are oftentimes some of the largest gifts that their supporters will ever make. Um, so it is something that most nonprofits at this point, if they don't have a program established, they really should start one. It's never too late. <laughs> you know, I think it's too late if you all of a sudden get the call that somebody, you know, has included your organization and you're like, holy moly, we didn't know, we don't know how to do it. And I've been part of those organizations where it's, it's shocking because they're oftentimes strings attached. Yes, and the thing I will say to you is that, and everyone else listening with us, 
it's never too late from the standpoint of there are so many available resources. Mm -hmm. There are folks who do plan giving who would gladly serve uh, in a place of uh, consulting or in a place of mentorship. If you're one of those organizations and you get a gift, uh, someone has included your organization and you don't know what to do next, reach out. There are so many folks in the plan giving space that have this knowledge and the experience they will gladly assist. And then there are other consulting agencies that are actually there for you to move sometimes challenging gifts along. Mm -hmm. Even for those of us who've been in plan giving for a while, we still have to consult with others who will work on more complicated, unusual gift oftentimes. So don't think you're alone in this. Just start where you are. I really appreciate that because, you know, I witnessed like this is something I don't have a lot of experience in, but we're going to talk about really this being perhaps outside the fundraising toolbox, uh, what that looks like for many of us in the nonprofit space, you know, how we can become a little bit more knowledgeable in this. So how does this sit or do you believe it sits outside the existing fundraising toolbox? What does that look like? Yeah, I. In a way, I agree with it fits outside of the existing toolbox at an organization. But in many ways, it's actually one big toolbox and plan giving happens to be in that toolbox. Right. We need playing gifts for our organizations. Those are the largest gifts oftentimes that you will ever see. So to not have a, a program around playing gifts, I think certainly is a missed opportunity. Uh, don't let fear hold you back. Find someone to partner with or mentor you through it. There are folks who are ready and willing to assist. Um, I'm part of the Charitable Gift Planners uh, Board, the national organization. We have a mentor program. And a lot of the mentees, we are in the second year now of this mentor program. A lot of the mentees are folks that are really one shop operation. So they're doing everything, major gifts, annual gifts. They're doing plan gifts. So plan gifts are certainly in the toolbox. I don't see it as really being outside of it. It needs to be in the fundraising toolbox. It's a fundraiser. Yeah. So for me, visually, I see it as like, especially that one person development team, right? Or maybe yeah. you have one and a half, maybe two. <laughs> it's like, we go to that multi-purpose tool, right? Like we yeah. go to that multi-purpose tool that's in our toolbox. And often it's like, oh, the planned giving, it's a little rusty. It's in there, but we haven't used it in a while. And I think we can all really flex that muscle. I know we we look at, you know, our aging constituency base. And that's been, I mean, I started my career 20 years ago and that was like, a concern, right? It's yeah. still a concern. I want to ask you, who should be, who should we be stewarding and cultivating for a planned gift? Is it a certain age demographic? Is it all donors? What does that look like? Yeah. And, and when I start thinking about what I will share here today, as far as trends, I had three items. I like working with odd numbers. Yeah. So the first item, the trend would be the baby boomers, the great wealth transfer that we are currently in today. We're not waiting on it to happen. It's already here. Yeah. So there are trillions of dollars. There are different reports on how many trillions, but nonetheless, it, there's a T. It's a T. It. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. It doesn't really, you know, at that point, at that level. At that point, you're so, right. yeah. So here we are there. They are with us, our baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And so this huge wealth transfer needs to be a part of what we're doing. Age, I would say it's never too early to start with the message. Yeah. So that would be all really of your donor base. However, we certainly want to fine tune the message when it gets to folks who are perhaps looking at retirement age. Um, of course, the baby boomers, uh, those 65, um, you certainly want to have a message that is geared towards them. And then of course, we're looking at folks in their 70s. We're looking at um, the IRA. That's another trend that I, I want to shed some light on also. The individual retirement accounts, the qualified charitable distributions, the required minimum distributions also. So 
that 60, 65, 70, 75 age group, I think those are going to be some of your ideal um, donors and supporters to really put that plan giving message out there too. Uh, then when you get into actually the 80s and Dr. Russell James, a guru of plan giving, he actually has data and information that shows that some folks will actually make their last update to their wills in their 80s. So that means the stewardship piece that you mentioned, if we have someone in their 70s or 60s to include our organization, there is a 20 plus year time frame. We need to do stewarding of these folks and steward them very well because there's still that chance they may update that that will in their 80s and say, oh, I haven't heard much from them. Right. So stewardship is critical. Legacy societies are very important. You can bring in all the plan gifts you want to. If you're not stewarding those folks, maybe they don't give major gifts, but their legacy gift is already confirmed for your organization. So you need to make sure you're reaching out to them every year, all year, different touches. Don't just put their confirmed bequest or legacy gift in the file and say, oh, yeah, they already love our organization, so we don't really have to do much for them. That's so far from the truth. They can still turn around one day and say, well, I haven't heard from them. I'll change that and put another organization in my They'll fall in love with somebody else. You know, I'm fascinated by the whole DAF uh, ecosystem, and this really tags into what you're talking about and one of those trends. Uh, The Giving USA report has really been... Uh, pointing this out and, and educating us about how this is a major vehicle that's being used. Um, but I had never heard anybody talk about until you just mentioned this, the generational aspect and the age movement of when people update their documentation. So I think it's a fascinating thing that you pointed this out. Um, I'm wondering, I know you're an attorney, are you seeing that we need to do a better job educating and communicating with those types of advisors and not just the actual folks involved with what we think is that wealth transference? Yeah. So professional advisors, you're wondering, should we engage them as well mm-hmm. into the work that we're doing at our organizations? Is that the question yeah, you're absolutely. proposing? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, Uh, I have been doing some research and looking into what a professional advisor's uh, advisory council would look like at our organization, or would it be a professional advisor's recognition society, where if a professional advisor, a financial planner, and a state planning attorney has a client and they're including our organization in their plans, do we recognize that financial advisor or that attorney in some way? Or do we just have a focus group with some professional advisors on the focus group? We can ask questions of them and figure out if the marketing material looks appealing or if we're going in the right direction with something that we're thinking about. Um, And we're having a a webinar on that at the Chesapeake Plan Giving Council later this month. Should your organization have a professional advisory council? So I do think we need to be in contact, in touch with financial advisors uh, estate planning attorneys, insurance folks, CPAs, you name it. Really, we're all working to serve the best interests of the client and our donors. And we all need to have a seat at the table. So yes, we certainly need to engage one another in this work that we're doing. And is that uh, a great chance, Aquanetta, for us to really lean into our board members and volunteer other volunteers in this way to ask them to help you know bring in this professional council absolutely you're in a a partnership with your board members um, your volunteers for your organization those in, in leadership positions we're all doing this work together they have great connections And so that's what you can tap into their networks. They may have a financial advisor that has a a special niche in their uh, practice. Uh, Maybe there's a presentation you're looking to do at some point for your legacy society or for folks of a certain age group. As I mentioned, the individual retirement accounts, there are huge opportunities for giving around 
IRAs. Maybe you're a board member, know someone who's a financial planner or an estate planning attorney. So absolutely, we need to certainly uh, utilize our volunteers, our board members, and make sure they have a, a part or play a part in getting these messages out. Then maybe a curveball. Do you also encourage that we solicit our board members for their own planned gift? Is that something that we should be, you know, I, I've seen several conversations lately <laughs> about don't forget to steward your board members, right? Just because they're on your board doesn't mean that you, again, set it and forget it. How should we go about planned giving conversations with our existing board? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful question. They're already in your organization. They they already support your organization. So you're not really struggling to get them to the point where they understand and appreciate your mission. They're already there. So certainly they would make good uh, potential plan gift um, givers. They're on board 100% with what you're doing. If not, they're in positions to bring up changes or suggestions as board members. So absolutely the conversations that we need to have with them Maybe it is something like a focus group or uh, sending them information. What do you think about this item that we're proposing to send to donors in our 65 to 70 age group? Okay. Does this look like it would be an appealing marketing piece to send to them? Yeah. Start would the conversation. Your attention, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, is this something that you and your partner would respond to? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And those are softer ways to get around it. Or you certainly can have presentations. You can have someone to come in or whoever's in your development shop can present to your board mm -hmm. on what the trends are, what's out there mm -hmm. yeah. with IRAs or with donor advised funds. Mm -hmm. They too are doing a bit of fundraising, or at least the board should be in those positions to do fundraising for your organization. So if they're aware of what's out there, I think it would help them as well with what they are doing for your organization. Yeah, get them involved. I think I've, it builds some muscle too. I think it's a great way to say, look, we're going to start this. This is going to be in our toolbox. We're going to be actively thinking this way. And so we're going to start with our board and we want honest feedback to say, how does this work for you? How does our team communicate about this? Because it can be a little dicey and a little uncomfortable. And then that really would build a lot of confidence, I th would think, with your development team to then move forward. Yeah, you know what's coming to mind right now? Uh, oftentimes there are questions that come from board members wondering, well, what sort of marketing are we doing out there? What what are we sending out? They really want to know. And oftentimes they're getting marketing pieces or fundraising uh, direct mail pieces from other organizations that they belong to. So if you're not asking them, someone else surely is. Right. <laughs> you can count on that. Yeah. So perhaps, you know, share with them, they're curious, are they on your mailing list when you send out something, whether it's an email, mm -hmm. do they receive the email or do you keep them out of that list? Right. A lot of people do. Oh, A that's so scary. One, wow. one of my practices, I know that I, every time I work with my clients, right, it's like all of your board members should be listed in your database, Right as well as their spouses, if they have any, our partners, right? As well as former board members. Because I also believe Aquanetta and, and school me on this, if this isn't, you know, accurate, even for former board members, right? Past board members are still, I believe, possibly great candidates in this planned giving space. Absolutely. I am a, a lover of genealogy and history. And, and so, I could see no reason why we would not include former or past right. folks in leadership and board positions yeah. in the work that we're doing. Yeah. They've actually contributed quite a bit of their time, their resources, their treasure to your organization. And to just have them at some point literally almost fall off the screen, so to speak, yeah. right. I, I think is, is a misstep. Huge and we need misstep. to include them in what we're doing. They played a part, a role in your organization. Keep them engaged. Yeah. I, I appreciate that so much. Let's move into um, our time always goes by quickly, but as we move into the final, you know, uh, time with you, can you share with us regarding wills, you know, what are some of the questions that we need to be asking? Um, and then, and then, and on top of that, I have a, a question 
I learned in my career that we need to have a copy of their living trust and will that states the organization that they're leaving a gift to. Can you talk to us about all of this? I mean, that's a loaded question. There's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, just think about this. The timing of this conversation, this discussion we're having today is very appropriate because August happens to be National Make a Will Month. So spread the message, get the word out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So perfect, perfect timing. Um, so with wills, most organizations will receive some sort of a gift through a person's estate. A will is most likely going to be the vehicle. And oftentimes the organization knows nothing about that particular gift. They had no clue it was coming. Most right. of them come that way. I am a huge fan of just a simple ask. If it's in a conversation, you're meeting with a particular supporter or donor, maybe they're making a, a, a gift. They've already made a gift, perhaps. You can certainly ask, have you thought about including our organization in your will? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about including us in your estate plan? Mm -hmm. Perhaps they'll say no. Perhaps they'll say, I already have. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they do. Even if it's a communication, an email, a newsletter, an annual report, do you put a, a one-liner in there? Have you included our organization in your will? Yeah. If you like more information, please contact blah, blah, blah. A simple ask, you would get a lot of responses from that oftentimes that you never would have expected, or perhaps you never would have received those responses if you didn't simply ask. So that's first. Um, don't make it complicated. For that initial ask, just get it out there. Ask the question. And the repeated message with this sort of conversation has to happen. Usually a one-time question is not going to be enough. Right. These sorts of things take a long time. People struggle with their state plans for various reasons. It can take months, if not years. Right. I've seen as an attorney where a client would come in and it would take sometimes several months before we actually had the signing ceremony, so to speak, mm -hmm. if not a year or two, there were challenges dealing with family dynamics and all sorts of other issues. Maybe they were selling a business. So it's not a one-time question or a conversation, repeated messages. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a second, I will answer your question about getting a copy of the documentation that includes mm -hmm. your organization. That would be ideal. Oftentimes people are reluctant. There are all sorts of issues regarding, I don't want to put my information out there. There's some privacy concerns. We can tell them everything we want to about how their information will be handled. Um, I suggest, and every organization is different. If you have a, a bequest intention form or a gift intention form, perhaps they can fill that out and give you a copy of only the part that includes your organization, not not the entire document. We don't necessarily need that. But just the, the page that includes your organization um, would be helpful. Sometimes they don't want to do that. Maybe that bequest intention form will be it. If they don't want to do that, whatever your organization decides is appropriate, um, maybe something in writing. It could even be an email or a handwritten note, depending on what your organization will see fit to, to make appropriate for your files. Um, but that would be helpful to get it in writing for sure. I love the intention wow. letter. Is that something that we as an organization should be providing and perhaps, you know, have a commitment form or as you said, that intention form? Is that something we should have in this fundraising toolbox of ours? Absolutely. You absolutely should. And again, keep it simple. It can be a one page item, ideally. Um, you just want to ask those basic questions. Of course, the person's name and, and depending on how you're reporting your uh, bequest or your plan gifts, you want to make sure that you have um, perhaps as much information as they will give you. Maybe their age, some will, some won't. Um, but yeah, ask them if they've included your organization, if there's an estimated amount or if they have an estimated the current dollar amount. Sometimes people will say, oh, that's the future. I have no idea what it will look like. Right. That's fine. The current dollar amount is really what most orgs will want. Um, and so have that in there. Sometimes people will say, oh, I'm leaving 25% of my estate. Have no idea of the dollar amount. Maybe they will be able to give you an estimated amount. 
Um, but but certainly if you could get that information, that would be helpful on that bequest intention form. What? You know, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I have so many follow-ups. I'm like, oh my God, the time's gone. Um, so Go I, I'm curious because you do mention we should continue to steward these donors, right? Even if they're not making major gifts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout their tenure, how often are, or do we not, is it, you know, bad form for us to go back and ask for a new intention form, right? Like if it's been a couple of years, five years, what that's does that look like? And again, I mean, I was raised in the South, Emily Post, and I'm like, oh, that's just bad etiquette, right? But like, what, what <laughs> should we do? Good question. That's a great that question. That is a good question. That is, and I do not have a year time frame or two, three years, four or five. I don't have that. I think it's going to be organization specific. Okay. If you're looking at donors, you haven't heard from them in a while, you're reaching out to them, hopefully, but you just haven't heard from them. Yeah. Maybe you look at their uh, contact information and you say, I'm just going to call them or let me send them an, an email, a handwritten note to check in. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a couple of years have gone by. You want to see if something has changed with them. You want to make sure you're keeping the most up-to-date information on them is how I would approach it. Okay. And so to put a one year, two year, three year, I don't have an, a number per se for you, but yeah. I would think each organization would be able to take a look and see how much activity they have around um, those donors they haven't heard from in a while. Mm -hmm. And they can go from there with maybe reaching out every couple of years or so to see if there's something new um, sure. with their bequest intention. You have been riveting and, and we need to spend more time with you because, you know, Jared made the, the comment when we started, let's start off with the definition. And I would have never, ever come to it the, from the direction that you did. So I can understand the value now more than ever about creating a legacy society where you, because then everything's done the same and it's a much easier sell to say, as a member of our society, th this is what we need to do. And this is how we steward it. Um, this has been amazing. Aquanetta Betts, um, really interesting conversation. And we talk about this a lot on the nonprofit show that we are in the middle of the greatest transference of wealth our nation has ever known. And so, yes, this is the conversation for today definitely be a part of this and understand it um, because it, it's just, it has so many implications for so many people. Um, wow. Jarrett, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it has been. This is again, a conversation that I'm not very informed about. And I, I love how you have brought so much wisdom, Aquanetta, to this. And I want to say to calmness, right? Because yeah. this, to me, this isn't like, oh, I can't wait to have this plan give <laughs> conversation, right? Um, but you you provide so many best practices and tips for us to, to use in a way that doesn't sa feel or sound icky. Uh, I so appreciate it. Really, I do. I mean, so so much great advice here. So I know our viewers and listeners are feeling the same. And this, again, this will be uploaded on all of our platforms in just a couple of hours. Give our executive producer a little bit of grace, uh, but he always gets it up in a timely fashion. So again, for those of you watching and listening, uh, Aquanetta Betts, thank you for joining both Julia Patrick and myself, Jarrett Ransom today. It's been a pleasure having you on. Um, and it's been wonderful to have the continued su support from our amazing presenting sponsors. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, as well as staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, as well as nonprofit tech talk. And watch out Aquanetta, because Julia now has your email and you know she's gonna keep fangirling. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think what Jared said was very magical, and that is, um, you brought a lot of calmness and grace to the process um, because it is such a threatening thing um, internally for these for people for families, and then we have these organizations, and then we have, you know, the ecosystem of legal advice, financial advice, you know, documentation. It's that's a lot, but it should be a lot because it's an, a very important thing. And so 
I loved um, hearing what you had to say. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our co-hosts to stay well so you can do well. Thank you.